this week, um, I was driving back from Medford, and I had um, I had just purchased um, some flooring for the building um, that we are working on. The space we're working on. And of all things, purchasing flooring, I didn't understand why I had this encounter that I'm going to tell you about. But I I had this sense that something was being released in the spirit. And I don't know if it was the 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 expense of what we gave um, or if it was something to do with the flooring, a place for people to stand strong, stand firm. I don't know what it was, but I, I had this sense and then I saw this vision of a waterfall flowing down. And, and as I was seeing that waterfall, as I'm driving, I just I sensed the presence of God so strongly in his joy that I that I almost closed my eyes and went off the road. Um, and then that waterfall turned into a vision of an ocean that was flowing, that was flowing. And I heard the Lord say to me, thank you for taking care of my people. Amen. There is something that is released into the atmosphere when we pour out our love to him in worship as a sacrifice for him and for others. There is something that is released that is not accessible otherwise. There are altars that are made with our actions and our words throughout our lives. But when we make an altar to Him, to worship Him, to sacrifice our bodies on the altar to Him, something is released that will not be released otherwise. When we say no and renounce the altars that we have made and simply turn And say, yes, I will follow you, Lord. Whatever that looks like. We are given courage. We are given a level of commitment that is not available otherwise. When we simply pour out our love back to the one who loves us. Amen. And God gives us, imparts to us the ability to trust in Him. To truly trust Him. To truly have faith in Him through any circumstance. The scripture says of King Hezekiah that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. And that wherever he went, he prospered. Hezekiah was the foremost of all the kings of the southern kingdom of Israel. He was the foremost. If you recall, Israel was split between the northern and the southern kingdoms. The southern kingdom of Judah, Hezekiah was the greatest of all the kings. There was none like him. And everything he did succeeded. How many of you would like everything you do to succeed? Amen. How many of you would like everything you touch to turn to gold? Amen. What was Hezekiah's secret? If there was none like him, he was a rarity. He is a rarity still. But do you want to know his secret? If there was none like him, there was something that he knew and things that he did that no other king in the southern kingdom of Israel did. Do you want to know what he did? Second Kings chapter 18 
If you want to read with me, you can. 2 Kings 18, verses 1 through 8 is what we're going to read. His secret, in a word, was he simply trusted in the Lord. He simply trusted in the Lord. Now, when I say any word, when any of us say a word, as many people as there are in the room probably have a little bit definition of that same word. One word, multiple definitions. Multiple connotations. So when I say trust, what do you think of? Every one of you might have a different picture and idea of trust. So it's important for us to be clear about the definition of trust and what trust looks like. And so that's what I'm going to do. By reading this chapter, we're going to see how Hezekiah trusted God and how we can trust God and how we can prosper at all that we do. How we can trust. See, just saying, let's trust God is one thing, but actually doing it and knowing how to do it is another thing completely, right? First Kings chapter 18, verse 1, it says, In the third year of Hosea, son of Eliah, King of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. How did he do what was right in the eyes of the Lord? That's right. Verse 4. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the ashtra. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. It was called... Um, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehashton. Verse 5. Listen to this. He trusted in the Lord the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. Listen to this. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from the wa from watchtower to fortified city. Hezekiah prospered in all that he did and illustrated what trust in God looks like by doing seven specific things. All of which required sacrifice on his part. He did seven things that required sacrifice on his part. It required him looking in the face of adversity and knowing that if he made certain decisions to follow God, that it could cost him dearly. And it did, actually. If you continue reading the story, Hezekiah, even though he was the greatest of the kings of Judah, he endured more battles than any other king I've read about. And I could be wrong. But if you read and you just skip through and you read through even just the rest of this chapter, you'll see he was besieged under his reign time and time again because he rebelled against the ways of the world, essentially. He would not ally himself with this foreign king. So the foreign king came and besieged him multiple times and it eventually took the people away. Now... Part of the reason that happened is because the people of Israel, did they turned away from the Lord. But the, the component of that that had to do with Hezekiah was his decision to not give in to that king. Hezekiah did seven things that illustrated his trust in God. Number one, he removed the high places. And you know, in our culture, we think of, of high places, and there might be some confusion about what that even means. Like, what is a high place? But a high place was where worship was made by sacrifice or offerings. It was an altar. It was anywhere that something was exchanged, something was sacrificed or given up in exchange for worship to something else or some something else. So you think about that practically 
in our lives? What are the things that we give or sacrifice our time for? What are the things we sacrifice or give our resources to? Those things, every time we make a decision to exchange time, resources, energy, affection for something, we are creating an altar. We are creating an altar of worship. The question is, what are we worshiping? And if we worship the one true God with our decisions, with our actions, we will prosper in what we put our hand to. Because what we put our hand to is what God is putting his hand to. And nothing God does fails. His plans succeed. So when we partner with him, we partner with success. So he removed the high places, the places where people had sacrificed of themselves, literally. They sacrificed their children on these hot burning arms of, of this foreign god. Sounds like modern day abortion, right? They sacrificed their children. They sacrificed their time. They wailed and, and, and cried out. We see that in the story of Elijah. They cut themselves. I mean, these people were devoted. These were supposed to be the people of God, and they sacrificed. They worshipped. Hezekiah also broke the pillars. Pillars are spoke of a monument or a personal memorial. This is very, very interesting. There are things. Um, I, I might be going out on a limb here. But when you think of a memorial, a personal memorial or a monument, okay, it speaks of something that we hold to, okay, that we hold dear that has happened in the past. And I wonder sometimes if Google Photos popping up on my screen with photos of my kids when they were young, how much that helps my present day state. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just throwing something out there because I've noticed that when I see those pop-ups and I go, oh, let's see my little kids when they were young. What fills my heart is regret. What fills my heart is, oh, I wish they were like that. It was so fun. It was so great. It was a good time. And I, I literally feel bad. I'm just like, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. Instead of remembering what's now, today. Right. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with remembering the good things that God has done. Memori memorials are good, but they need to be the right kind of memorials to God's faithfulness and his goodness and what he's done in our family with our kids. But sometimes I get those pop-ups and I go, man, it just reminds me of like what I didn't do. I didn't spend enough time with them or whatever the case is. And maybe that's just me letting the enemy do what he does. But either way, the past should never define our present and our future. So what Hezekiah did is he broke the pillars. He broke the memorials, actually, that were remembrances of the past. Isn't that crazy? He also cut down the Astra. This is interesting. What this, this is the third thing that he did. It was a Babylonian Canaanite goddess of fortune and happiness. <laughs> Is that not the like American idol of all? Like anything for some happiness, right? Anything for to feel good. And 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 it's it's crazy because you think about how that has manifested itself in like day to day life. When times are difficult, what do we want? Yeah, we want them to not be difficult. When we feel pain, what do we want? The pain to leave. Okay, so the, those things are part of life. But then the question is, what do we do to address that pain and that difficulty? That right there is the, that decision point is what makes all the difference. It really is at that moment I know people who will instantly turn to drugs. They will go directly. Their default is to get high. And then they get dry. Or their default is to go to, I'll just say, an illicit relationship. To find 
A counterfeit for love. Yeah. A cheap knockoff for love. In the middle of that pain, when things get hard, even doing God's work, the temptation is to go try to find an asterisk. Try to find something that makes us happy. And even that can include seeking out the wrong things that are even normally good things. I might offend some people here. But are we pursuing Jesus even in church settings in America? Or are we pursuing an experience? I am all for experience. Or on the other end of the spectrum, are we pursuing Jesus or are we pursuing the gaining of intellect, right? So whatever the case is, it makes us feel happy. There's that fine line. But when we pursue him, the happiness follows. When we pursue him first, the other things come with that, right? Right? And, we, and, and we're safe in that place. When he is first in our heart, we are safe from the entanglements of idolatry. And when we are, when we are safe in that, in that place of intimacy with him, all that we experience in that place is as it should be. The experiences, a growing of even learning, whatever it is, if we are doing it in his presence, in pursuit of our love with him, it's, we are in a safe place. We are under the shadow of his wing. Mm-hmm. But when we step out from that, even if it looks religious and nice and feels good, it becomes an idol in our lives. And it draws us away from the one that deserves all of our love. It's an astra. Hezekiah broke those things down. I mean, who built those things? His subjects, if you will, the people of Israel. Do you think that he knew that if he broke these things down that were dear to them, that he would face consequences potentially? Do you think that he would make some people angry if he as the king tore down things that people held dear to them? But he did it anyway. Number four, he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses made. So not only did Hezekiah remove the high places where people sacrificed their time, energy, effort for things other than God, not only did he break down the pillars and the asterisk, the things that made people feel good but were apart from God, but he also broke down the religion of yesterday. He He took the bronze serpent that brought healing, physical healing, by God's dictate by God's design in a previous season he took that bronze serpent and dashed it to pieces why because they worshiped it and they gave it a name it had gotten a religious name a title rather than God himself And he said, this thing is taking the people's heart away. It's taking their heart away. And I, as the king, have to do something about this. So he used his authority as the king to break that down. Mm -hmm. Number five. So it shifts here from what he broke down to what he did in pursuit of the Lord. Number five, he did not depart from the Lord, but kept his commandments. It says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. And we often hear that and think, oh my goodness, I need to prove my love to God by keeping his commandments. Nope, that's backwards. He said, if you love me then you will have the ability to keep my commandments. When we love him, oh, oh man, when we are passionately in love with him, we want to keep his commandments. Because his commandments aren't burdensome. His commandments are actually freedom. Not keeping his commandments are burdensome. And it's bondage to not keep his commandments. 
But see, the enemy, Satan himself, has twisted it and turned it backwards. He says, keeping God's commandments is burdensome. It's a bunch of work. And yes, it is, if we don't love him. But when we love him, we're empowered like Hezekiah was. To trust him and walk out our love for him with our actions. We can't help but do it. It's natural. I can't help but love my wife in my actions because I love her in my heart. I can't help it. I don't want to hurt her. It doesn't mean I always um, do everything that's going to bless her. It doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes and stumble and say things that hurt her. Of course not. But my heart, if I do anything that blesses her and shows love to her, it's because I love her in my heart. It's because my commitment at this, the, my, from my inmost being is for her. That's why I love her. That's why I love her with my actions and my words. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. If I'm not committed to someone... I won't do anything for them. And it just feels like a, 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 a bummer. But if I love someone, it's a joy to serve them. Amen. And that's what we get access to when we commit ourselves to our lover, capital L. Right. When we're committed to our lover, we can't help but serve him. When we see how much he's loved us, fruit's going to come off my tree. Because he's the one fertilizing it. And he's the one that's made me a new creation that bears a certain kind of fruit. It just happens. Number six, who? There's like probably three categories in these seven different things. The first is like getting rid of things. The second is following him and, and doing what he says, what the Lord says. And this, these last two things are going to war against the enemy. Yes. It's not either or, it's and, and, and. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It's not just like, Let's just only love God with our actions, but not get rid of the crap in our life. Right. doesn't work. Let's go ahead and get rid of the crap in our life, but never respond to his love. Let's go ahead and get rid of the crap, love him with our actions, but don't resist the enemy. Won't work. We need all three. So Hezekiah, number six here, it says he rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. Ooh, I love that warrior's heart. Yeah. He's like, man, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to serve this foreign king. I'm not going to make alliances with him. I'm not going to do the political thing. I'm going to do the passionate thing. I'm going to follow my God. He rebelled against anyone who would take him captive, despite any alliances and help offered by or from the world system. He also didn't care about the repercussions of not bowing to such people. That's right. Number seven, it says he struck down the Philistines. You think of Goliath, right? He was a Philistine. The Philistines were the enemies of the people of God. So Hezekiah, he warred against the enemy on behalf of God's people. So how did Hezekiah... Have strength, commitment, and courage to do all of that. No other king of Judah did what he did. It's not like it was commonplace. It's not like it was commonplace. How did he do it? I would submit, although it's not mentioned in this passage, I would submit to you he did it. The, the, The nuclear energy, if you will, that propelled him to be able to do these things 
was because he was planted by streams of living water. Listen to this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. That's what he did. He removed the wickedness from the land. Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. He pursued the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Listen to this. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. King Hezekiah says that all he did prospered. So we know that he was planted by streams of living water. And he bore fruit in keeping with those streams. And with the fruit that lined up with who he was on the inside. Hezekiah did the opposite of what the people of Israel did during Jeremiah's time. Right. Jeremiah 2.13 For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Listen to verse 14. Is Israel a slave? Is he a homeborn servant? Why then has he become a prey? Ooh, verse 15. The lions have roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitant. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. When we, by our actions, make altars to other gods, if you will, little g, we open ourselves up to be devoured by the enemy. The enemy sees that and, and, and jumps on it. That is his opportunity. Do you see? When we, when we step away from the one who is stronger than Satan, because we're not, but the Lord is. When we step away from him, we open ourselves up as prey to the roaring lion. That's what happened to Israel. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves. Their own cisterns, basically. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. But, this is, here's a twist for you. We actually are cisterns. We are water bearers. You've heard the term that you are light bearers, right? We're also water bearers. Proverbs 5, verse 15 says, Drink water from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well. Your own well. Should your strings be streams, springs, sorry, be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Drink water from your own cistern. So the problem was Israel was making cisterns for themselves by simply departing from the Lord. So when the pain came, when the hardship came, when whatever came, they didn't come to him. They went from him. They went to something else. At that inflection point, at that moment of decision, when things got difficult, they ran to other lovers. And they spewed out their streams into the streets. They hoard themselves, if you will, rather than staying true to their one love. And because of it, they open themselves up as prey to be taken and devoured and have their, their life blood just completely sucked from them. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, man, out of his heart, his heart, out of his heart will flow streams of living water. Rivers of living water, actually. Yeah, 
Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, 37-39. So the way that we keep our cisterns full, you know, is by going to the ocean. Who is him? The ocean that is him. And he, so he can fill us again and again and again. And those cisterns won't be broken. They won't leak. They'll pour. They'll gush. They don't leak. They gush. This morning, I heard the Lord say something. He spoke and he said this. Come to the waters. Come to my waters. Do not run elsewhere. I am here waiting for you. Give to me what is mine. When you do, you will find life. It is by giving what is not yours... That you lose what is yours. I had to think about that one. It is by giving what is not yours. That you lose what is yours. Come get everything you need. It is found in me. All you need is found in me. I am yours and you are mine. Together we are one. I have life. Life more abundant. It will be yours. So today and this week, I want you to do something. I want you to do seven things, actually. I want you to go and remove the high places. Wherever and whatever you may have been sacrificing of your time, energy, resources, whatever it is, go find those high places, identify them. And remove them. Break the pillars. Think of the past memorials that you have made that have a place in your heart where the Lord says it's time to let those things go. It wasn't better back in 82. (laughs) Those weren't. They may have been the glory days, but I have better days. Amen. Amen. No. Amen. Okay. I'm breaking the bronze serpent as well. Because I have me to give you. It's time to cut down the asterisk. Whatever makes you happy that is apart from him. Whatever salves your pain, that is not him. If it is not him, it is not him. Whatever makes you happy that is not him, is not him. Do you hear me? Whatever salves your pain and dulls the sadness, if it is not him, it is not him. And if it is not him... It is of the enemy. And it will take and capture your heart and your life and you will be its captive. And it will take and steal from you more than you ever thought you would have to give. It will rip you off and tear you down if you do not tear it down. It will thrash you. It will leave you broken and with nothing if you do not take authority over it. You must not be kind to the things that destroy us. You must war against them because you are not on a playground. You are on a battlefield.
And you must break down walls before you can build foundations. I want you to go home this week and to recommit your heart to the one who has committed his heart to you. Again, so that you won't depart from him no matter what tasty thing crosses your plate. That when those things come to your table, they will look like the dung that they are. And they will lose their taste in comparison to the sweetness of his spirit and the depth of his love and the intimacy of the Lord Jesus. And I want you to sixthly rebel, rebel against anything of the world that wants to take you and make you into its image. With the heart of Caleb, stand and say, we are well able to overcome them. The Philistines, the enemy, we are well able. So I impart to you by the spirit, the courage of Caleb today. To fight against those things as you fight for others, as you run hard after your passionate lover who loves you so much. And as you strike down the Philistines, as you run hard after your lover, as you break down the things that should not be in the mix, you will find that trusting and loving your God is easy. And the difficulty that you remembered from yesterday will not even be remembered anymore. You will only see forward, not backward. You will only see one set of eyes, not many, because you will be in love with your lover. You see, to not do the things that I mentioned, the first four things, is to not trust God. Trusting God looks like tearing down. Trusting God looks like tearing things down. Secondly, trusting God looks like keeping his commandments and obeying him when he says by his spirit and he whispers in the thin silence, I want you to do something. I want you to say something. And you say, I love you. That's no problem. And thirdly, Trusting him looks like warring against the enemy and resisting the devil that he might flee from you. It is not or, or, or. It is and, and, and. Trusting God looks like these things because talk is cheap. Saying we trust God is not trusting God. Saying we have faith in God is not faith in God. Saying we believe in God is not belief in God. Unless we do something. And that something is simply responding to him. That is what trust looks like. And God told Hezekiah, get rid of this stuff. And pursue me with all your heart. And say no to the entanglements of the world. And Hezekiah did it. Not doing these things and not holding to the Lord is tantamount to hewing out our own cisterns. But when we prove by our actions that we truly do trust him, our stream of life, our only stream of life, and are given over to him, he will flow out of us and we will bear fruit. We will have life and that more abundant. It will be ours, as he prophesied to me this morning. His life will be ours. 
when we come to the waters, when we come to Him. Holy Spirit, I love you. Father, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And we just, today we forget all the memorials we've made (laughs) that have taken us away from you. We forget and we break down, Lord, the religion of yesterday, God. We tear down right now in our hearts and and commit to tear down in our lives this week and this day anything, Lord, that is we've been entangled with, Lord, because you love us. We thank you, Lord, that every single time Israel cried out for help, you helped them. You, you sent a judge to come and deliver them from their enemies, God. Despite their heart turning away so many times, every time they cried out, you delivered them, God. And you are the same God then or today that you were then. That today when we cry out, Lord, although there may have been entanglements and mixture in our lives, Lord, You are a God who is rich in mercy and ready to forgive. You are a God who pours out oceans of life upon us and through us. God, we just come to you and we thank you for your kindness, God. We thank you for your love that we get to serve our lover. Mm, You're so good. And I just declare today that anyone in here who needs healing in their body, will receive it. I just declare today that anyone today who has been beat down by the lies of the enemy will find the truth of God as they worship God in spirit and in truth. I declare today that what worked yesterday by the enemy will not work tomorrow. And it will not work today. I declare today that his plans have been exposed in your life. And you will be exposing his plans in others' lives. I declare today that life will come out of your inmost being as you trust in and believe in Jesus. 